Man, welcome to episode 158, the prelims portion of the UFC Mexico City Moreno Roy Val 2 fight night breakdown. God, that was a mouthful. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about these prelims. And and man, we'll dive straight to it because we got a guy jerking the curtains that I do not believe should be jerking the curtains. Like, I believe this guy, hot take if you want, is a top 20 featherweight, bro. Uh, well, I'll say it like this. He's the tied for biggest favor on the card essentially so i mean right behind Haragi, but that's because she's fighting ass dog shit worst fighter maybe in the ufc sam page hughes so like and eric silva's not very good either but yeah he didn't he have is, a dance partner he and he's is, not mexican so. yeah and he also won in 44 seconds so kind of looked For like sure, but I mean, you look at naimov's resume he has a win in his debut up a weight class against jamie malarkey we, we have varying opinions on jamie malarkey i'm higher on him than you but fighting a tall big tough ass lightweight and beating him in your debut impressive as fuck then he comes back down to featherweight and kind of gets the opposite end of the spectrum beats nathaniel wood who's very good but has taken fights at bantamweight, weight a very small featherweight so i mean i think he's only two and oh maybe three and oh coming into this one but with wins over Nathaniel Wood and Jamie Mularkey, like as your first two fights, I believe, in the UFC, like, I don't know, man. I'm kind of high on Naimov, which obviously Vegas is too. Naimov has also fought dogs in his career. He fought Landon Quinones in his third fight and has a win there. He, is, he lost to Colin Anglin on the Contender Series, so Colin Anglin obviously made it to the UFC after that. So maybe a, a time of, like, just wasn't ready at that time. That was four years ago. Uh, and then as a loss in a title fight against uh, Olivier Murad, who I don't know who that is, but he's beaten everyone else since that. So yeah, man, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty high on on, on Naimov here. Um, it's crazy too. So right after, I always like look at the fights right after last week's fight in, which is pretty cool. That's where I found out that uh, who's the old boy that was on Rogan it's slipping my mind gambling. Uh, oh, Billy Walters. That's Billy Walters. Now, now Joe, I tell you, Joe, it's in the book. Uh, now, why I put it in the book? Was so it could be in the book. Dude, I, I fucked with it. I was listening to that. No, it was great. But, he, uh, just, he just continually told me about how it's in all. It's all in the book. Yeah, bro, he's a bag getter. He's trying to get that bag. But uh, I feel it. Like, uh, but uh, but, but he don't hear it say as soon as football season ends, you start on the next one. That's me with these fights. Dude, week, bingo, week bingo. I was gonna say like, we're, it's, I had a revelation, and this is why I texted you that I feel really good about our picks is because. I'm now at the point where, like, if you announce a fight, I can tell you the odds or what I think they should be without having to go look at Caesars or anything. You know what I mean? Well, and then also, like, this week, all the lines that moved, lines, they moved according to, like, our picks, basically. Like, we just lost a ton of value. Like, when, I'm, when I was looking at these last Saturday night, Naimov was minus 190. Well, by the time this fight started... We got him at minus 600. El Dorado really fucked us here. He finished at minus 535 on the TV. We got him at minus 600. Fucking ate shit on the value there. But, um, but yeah, Muhammad Naimov, minus 535, minus 600, however you want to look at it. Taking on the 36-year-old Eric Silva, plus 400, featherweight division. And see, this fight is going to not, I guess, age well for Naimov. Not that it would have regardless because I think Eric Silva's kind of a can. It's a can but, crushing. And Silva gets hurt, but like, but he doesn't even get the credit, right? Because this is gonna, this goes down as a TKO due to injury. However, I watched the fight with my own eyes. There was a head kick landed, and and when the head kick landed, even if it was partially blocked, it caused Silva to like step backwards, and that's when he hurt his knee. He was like knocked off balance with a head kick. Like this isn't some fluke injury. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent like Naimov, like destroyed his body but like it's also not some like non-contact you know mini camp acl tear like doing pat and goes like this is i also don't think it changed a whole lot about the fight because naimov landed one significant strike and it was the punch to the face in their first like literally their first exchange and like the look on silva's face changed and then he steps back and blows his knee out so like, but like, like, I, like I don't also, know, like, I guess they're not counting the spinning head kick landed because I guess it was blocked, but it was blocked, which knocked him off balance, which caused him to take the back bad step. Like, like, I just saw this as like, like, yeah, the guy got hurt. It also looked like it was like leagues different in skill off the rip. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, this fight lasted 44 seconds. Like I said, I don't want to spend all day talking about it. We've already spent a decent amount of time. It does come back. Silva did tear his MCL, which I guess I'm being just hard-ass McGee tonight because I was kind of hard on Rosas for not coming out because he was lightheaded. But, like, we've known guys. We have friends that played, like, half a football season with a torn MCL. So, like, like torn MCL, don't get me wrong, scary, probably doesn't feel great. But I don't think it's like a – show stop or per se we've seen guys finish fights with torn acls right like well, so i mean we've seen we've seen uh peter yawn uh blow his knee out against or i'm sorry uh, uh what a fucking tj dillashaw blow his knee out against san Hagen to win the fight we've yep. seen i've seen josh emmett didn't he do it once mm-hmm. upon a time yep yeah and i've also seen uh, francis Ngannou had no mcl whenever he beat zero gone and dominated him yeah. And then also, so, I've personally been at a OU basketball game uh, when Blake Griffin was there where he tore his MCL, went in at halftime, put a knee brace on, and played the second half. And that's basketball. Yeah, and he's 6'10". So, like, yeah, yeah no, I, I I don't know. I don't want to be hard on a guy because it was an actual injury and it is documented, but I think he found a way out of there. I don't know. Like I said, maybe, maybe it went as good as it could have gone for either guy. Silva didn't take more damage. Naimov can get a quick turnaround. Maybe this fight just ended how it was supposed to end. Naimov gets the win. Like I said, I'm very high on Naimov. I have him all the way up behind Sadiq Yusuf. I got to say, though, I've never been high on Sadiq Yusuf. I have Sadiq Yusuf much lower than other people have him. I have him above JSP. I have the perfect I have the perfect thing for Naimov. JSP is not terrible. But honestly, the loser of Yusuf and... Uh, d- yeah, the loser of that could honestly fight Naimov. Yeah, and I think that's going to be Yusuf, and which lines up basically with my rankings just ahead of time. And then, yeah, I, JSP would work. I see the I mean, path you already to the beat fight. Nathaniel Wood. Because um, otherwise, you're getting up to the Egays and Barbosas and Mitchells of the world. And I don't think he's quite there. But like I said, I don't have Yusuf on that same level as those guys. 100% um, agree. I could see uh, like Alex Caceres. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I flirted with that one too. I flirted with that one too. I um, yeah, no, that would work. That would totally work. Or even like maybe even a Sean Woodson. Um, oh, that'd be fun. Like, Sean Woodson yeah, loves like to spoil parlays, though. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. But uh, let's keep it pushing. Hold on, I'm gonna go grab my ski mask real quick because we got a fucking robbery to get to. Here. Robbery of the year. Robbery of the year. Robbery of the year. Yep. Um, we got we got flyweights. We got a fuck ton of flyweights on these prelims, which is kind of cool. Actually, I thought it was going to be cool. I thought it was going to kind of clarify the middle to back end of flyweight, and it kind of just murked it up more. I find like I think all these guys are basically on the same level as each other. Um, I nobody really jumped super out to me, and nobody really disappointed either. I don't know, but but we'll get to it. Um, Victor Alta Morano plus two thirty. Taking on Felipe Dos Santos, he's only 23 years old. Um, we had him on our parlay. Once again, shout out El Dorado for the dog shit value. He finished up minus 285. We got him at minus 300. <laughs> um, Felipe Dos Santos is 0-1 in the UFC. Why would you give an 0-1 guy a three-star lock? Well, he gave Manel Cop all he fucking wanted, who's like a t- bona fide top 10 guy, fought him tooth and nail. And Altamirano, I think he's 2-3 and three in the UFC, only two wins being over ultra cans. And the loss is not being the super elite guys either. And so, it has a goofy style. Like, yeah. as far as those five fights, he has that weird, like, kind of off. It's like, it, you know, some guys fight, like, in rhythm, timing, Topuri, a beautiful example of, like, if you put, like, music behind that guy, he'd be, like, fighting to music. You put music yeah. behind this guy, and he's, like, a scratchy record. Like, just fucking weird, like, gangly. <laughs> Fucking blue face song off beat. Like yeah, just off, yeah, like off <laughs> like off beat. That's how he feels. At least until this fight. And then this fight, I don't know what the fuck happened, but he decided I'm just gonna become a wrestler and just and win the positions and do decent damage in the transitions. Yeah, man, let's get to it, man, because I think people were overrating Santos because this gets to be the classic control versus damage debate. And I saw people firing off some spicy takes on Twitter talking about, you know, the whole, that whole debate. And, 
and I don't think my thing is I don't think either guy got a lot of damage off. Actually, Alta Morano's coach posted a picture of him after the fight, proving this yeah. exact point, saying y'all talking about damage. Alta Morano was smiling and had zero marks on his face, zero cuts, literally zero, zero swelling. Um, everybody's saying Santos this fucking damage battle. Like I kind of agree with Team Alta Morano here. Like what damage? And this is as a guy who bet Dos Santos. I want to keep saying that. Because I'm very thankful to the gambling gods that this leg ends up hitting. Shout but, out to me, you, and Boogerbeard. We all did the same thing. Scored it for Do- for Altamirano, bet it for Dos Santos. For sure, bro. Um, and I guess we got to go round by round, which watching this fight live, I didn't find it hard to score. I thought Altamirano won one all day, every day, but he got six takedowns. I do have in my notes. Little control or damage. You can't get six takedowns if you're getting the control with them. So I feel you. They weren't great. But Dos Santos, like we alluded to, didn't get a lot of damage off himself and got taken down six times and spent most of the round getting back up or defending takedowns. Even if you want to call it octagon control, I mean, what did Dos Santos do in that round? It felt like Dos Santos was like playing the long game because he was like almost essentially giving up the takedowns and then using the fence to stand up. And it felt like he was maybe trying to drain Altamirano and just make him continually use the energy because he was using low-energy stand-ups and effectively just kind of standing against the cage to defend the takedowns. It wasn't like he was actually sprawling. He was just leaning his back up and trying to sink his arms under each time, which, dog shit defense. We'll get to that. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I scored it for Altamirano. If, if anyone's doing anything in the round, it's him. So, 10-9 all, sure. for, all three judges score it that way as well. Now, round two... He only gets two takedowns, but I actually thought Altamirano got more damage off in two than one, so you get less takedowns, but a little more control and a little more damage. I like the work. He got some good kicks off. Um, I, I have in my notes that Dos Santos did touch the chin a couple times, but like, if anybody looked tired, it was Dos Santos. I feel like there wasn't a ton on those shots. They were like diminished. I 100% agree with you. The best damage Dos Santos got in the second round was the second time he got taken down near the end and he was just raining elbows to end. That actually looked really good. But I still scored that round for Altamirano. Once, now, that I agree with everything you said about Altamirano getting more damage, a little more control, uh, having a little more positional control as well, like not letting him get right back up. But yeah, at the same time, I also thought Dos Santos did a little more damage. I thought he kept the round close. Yeah. I, I, think, I think while you're fair. balling the round to Dos Santos is kind of tough here. But I, I, obviously two judges do. So I just don't think Dos Santos did enough damage. Like, not, none I of those shots wobbled him. None of those shots cut him. None of those shows, shots made the nose leak. None of those shots even really like stunned him or made him make a face or anything really. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I scored it for Altamirano, so did you. Now, round three, I do give to Dos Santos. I, however, I thought round three was, like, the closest round to score. Um, I, I had a hard time kind of scoring it because Altamirano got, it, got a takedown, kept on with the body kicks. But I thought Dos Santos' is damaged to the head, and he started marching forward in that round. He got, like, a rear naked choke attempt, I think, in, like, a scramble. I, I, I gave round three to Dos Santos, but not one and two, and I felt pretty good about that. Yeah, I felt – I felt really good about that. I thought round three was the only round you could have described in the fight as like a war because there was yeah. actually separation activity, shots being thrown. Um, and I thought that favored Dos Santos a little more than it did Altamirano, to be quite honest. Um, so as close as it was, I still liked a lot more of what Altima- or what Dos Santos was doing in a lot of the exchanges. Um, so I added it as a competitive 10-9 for Dos Santos. Now I have a 29-28 Altamirano. Uh, no judge has that scorecard, which is crazy because that's what you and I have. But yeah, it, it all comes down to round. Well, one judge also gave round three to Altamirano. I know, which I I don't. I honestly don't hate giving three to Altamirano. He said I thought round three was kind of hard to score. I, I I hate giving Dos Santos one. Did any judge give Dos Santos one? Uh, no, that's what's crazy is the two judges that score the fight for him give him two and three. And I'll tell you what it is. I know what it is. You know what? It's, I'll, it's, I'll walk it this. back. It wasn't robbery of the year. It wasn't robbery of the year. I disagree with the scorecards, but anytime I can like see how you arrive to a conclusion, I can't go straight up robbery. 
I'll walk it back. I'll put my ski mask back in the back if, in the if, car. This is my point. If anything, the robbery too though is the thirty twenty seven. Like I don't. I think it's tough to say all three rounds were all Toronto. And here's why I say that: he didn't really do much damage either. Uh, but see, I wasn't far off from that scorecard. The guy had one and two but, firmly to Altamirano, and why? I had round three as like a pretty close round. But you have one and two to Altamirano for the the grappling, right? Yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah, do that sure. in round three. So it's like you take away his grappling. How's he winning the round? I, I'll make an argument that round three, because of just the nature and style of the round, was his best striking round as well. You could argue he got outstruck, but it was. Okay, agreed. But we agree he got outstruck and his grappling wasn't able to be used, so it's like, I don't know how he no. wins the round. I, I think me and you have the right scorecard, which is crazy, because we're not getting paid to judge fights, and these fucking, you know, jerk-offs and saw if, it If anything, different. we'd be losing money to score it that way. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, literally. Literally. Which um, I think would be worth it for the integrity of the fucking sport. But yeah, I feel bad for Anto Morano, because now he has like a 2-4 and four record, probably going to get cut. But his and style Santos, does suck. Like, that fight kind of sucked. And we've seen Dos Santos put on a really fun fight. So it makes me think that... Because Altamirano not always in the most fun fights. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that. Um, But Altamirano, exactly. Like what I, I'm going to kind of say what you're saying in a different way. It's not like Altamirano jumped up my power rankings with this performance. I still have him at the back end. Now, I did have to drop Dos Santos down quite a bit just because of the fact... That win, lose, draw, whatever. This fight was very, very competitive with a guy, Morano, who we don't think is elite. So I think that's closer to his level than the cop fight. Um, oh, because Alta ha- ha- has the loss to Shirez. Like I'll put it this way, bro, and I'll I'll, I'll copy and paste this for the future flyweight bouts we're going to discuss on these prelims. I think Joshua Van dog walks all these dudes. Every flyweight besides the main event. I, I'll give me Joshua Van over all of them, personally. Well, you know what I'm noticing is uh, Altamirano, he he's 3-3, three 2-3 three, uh, three in the UFC, but if you count his Contender Series win. Contender. The Contender Series win was against Carlos Candelario. I remember that fight. It was terrible, and it was a split decision. <laughs> and then he lost his first fight in a split decision, and then he knocked out Daniel Lacerda. What's that mean? Yeah. Literally the worst fighter that we have in that division. And then he gets a unanimous decision over Venetia Salvador. What's, can. what's that worth? And it's a decision. And then he loses a decision to Tim Elliott. Tim Elliott, obviously not a can. And then loses a split to Dos Santos. And it's like, it's not a good spot to be in. Like, Altamirano, while he might have a roster Altamirano spot. Altamirano overs, though, as a batter. Oh, yeah. Altamirano overs. But uh, my point but. is, while he might, like, be in a place where he could like command a roster spot near the back end, right? And fight prospects and continually keep his career alive. My point is this, his style sucks to watch. Like he is very, very not memorable. He gets a lot of splits. He has five splits on it in his, in the last four years. Why do you think that is? He's not doing any damage. He's just doing a lot of controlling. I imagine. Yeah. We got a member to maybe bet the over. Or if we aren't even going to bet against him, bet like even the guy to win that against him to win by decision. Yeah, you know fate, what I'm saying? Fate, like, yeah, there's va- there's value in that trend. Agreed, agreed. Uh, let's, well, keep let's keep it pushing. pushing. We got more flyweights. Yeah, we got even more flyweights. And this fight was actually kind of sick. This fight was fun. This fight was the exact opposite of an Ultimate Rondo fight. Um, we got debutant, 24 year old Ronaldo Rodriguez minus 120 taking Dennis Bondar plus 100. And, um, man, round three was pretty sick. I, I had it very close. Um, Rodriguez, you know, two reversals, and he did land with some, some nice blows. I like Bondar's elbows from both top and bottom, and he landed that one nuke right hand. Um, I thought Bondar won the damage battle. Uh, but fun-ass round, man. I mean, this round was back and forth. There were scrambles. There was haymakers. There was elbows. There was reversals. You awesome. Know, you know what was crazy, uh, and I think I put this in the in the text chain, was that Bondar looks like his technique is damn near perfect in all the stuff he like goes for. His shots were great. His transitions were great. His strikes are great. I don't know that he's necessarily a plus athlete. In fact, I know he's not. I, and I don't know that he has like a lot of power, and it's flyweight, so it's like how much power would you even have? 
And then I also don't know about his chin being the one last thing. So it's like, for all the things that would make him a great coach, he has all the things that also make you a bad fighter. So it's like a weird, weird differential. I hate saying that about a guy that's obviously like not a terrible fighter would beat me up. But here's the one thing I noticed too. As for as technical as he was, he would throw these awesome combos, and Rodriguez was so fucking game to just stand in the pocket and eat the shots to counter back that if Bondar had done like Max Holloway, boom, 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 one, two, three, four, five, and then out, right? And then a nice, nice transition out of the combination, good footwork, don't admire your punches, right? He was admire. he was painting a picture and standing back to look at it, and that's when Rodriguez was landing bombs on him. Yeah, yeah, and also, man, I hate when people tap at fifty four fifty nine. Like that's Bro. just never gonna sit right with me. Like, I mean, maybe if it's like a knee bar and it's like literally like maybe your career on the line, but what it was a rear naked choke. My thing is, if you hear the the clap, right? Which yeah. it's wood blocks, like it's made to be able to like, it's a different sound than anything else you'll hear all night. Like you'll know that sound if you hear that, and the choke's not even locked in you should probably be able to hold your breath for at least five seconds. And then the blood choke is going to take at least 10 to 15. So you're good. Yeah. Like words, like we've seen it before where guys are basically like waking up as the round ends, but Oh, well, the fight goes on. Right. right? Like, like if you stand up, we're still fighting. Yeah. I hate seeing taps Two rear naked chokes specifically. I said, if it's a knee <laughs> bar or something where you're going to lose years of your career, Hey, I more understandable, but a rear naked choke tap at four fifty nine. I'm actually taking a page out of Chael's book here. This this was a way out. I saw Bondar get broken in the second. Like I, you could visibly see the man get broken. Yeah, well, so I mean, let's let's get to it because actually Bondar gets the takedown, but I then scored. he gets reversed from bottom, and then he transitions smoothly to the back. Bondar did land the spinning back elbow, which is pretty fucking sick at the start of the round. Like that's yeah. about as good of a spinning back elbow. But you speak to your lack of athleticism it. and power, lack of athleticism and power. Like if you can land a textbook spinning back elbow and not even really knock the guy down, like what? It's a, just like, like there's no that? explosive force on the strikes. Like they're you know they're beautiful like technically, but they're not explosive and dangerous. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's the proof is in the pudding. So yeah. Rear naked chokes for Ronaldo Rodriguez, which I think getting a finish over Bondar's second round in your debut, I mean, you can't ask for anything more out of Rodriguez. And the dude's a a fucking dog. Like, I'll watch him fight any day of the week because he fights like Poirier. Like, he sits in the pocket, will eat the first one or two to fire back, like, three or four of his own that are, like, dead. Like, he was swinging for the fences, too. I mean, call it lazy matchmaking if you want, but, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world pretty much a layup. I think you book him and Dos Santos. Oh, I think yeah. that's like basically a layup. Like just kind of tournament bracket, just both fought same night, both won. Super bracket. fun fight too. It's like super fun fight. And then Bondar and Altamirano are both in the same spot where they'll, they'll be kind of be lucky to have a job Ooh, on Monday. Like honestly. I actually, I, I would see. I would like to see them fight each other if they are both kept, just because Altamirano technically has like nothing. Like he's the most awkward, funky dude, whereas Bondar is like. You know, technical. All, tec- all technical, but lacks that athlete. So it'd be like a fun matchup of, will the technique like be enough to overwhelm Altamirano, who's just a goofy, funky, non-athletic guy himself? I'll put it this way. It'd be a fun one to bet the over on. I don't know if it'd be fun to watch, but... <laughs> it, it, <laughs> would be, it would be that. You ain't lying. <laughs> but uh, let's keep it pushing to these lightweights, man. Um, we got Therese Zion, minus 205, taken on Claudio Poyes, submission specialist. To a fault, man. I add a uh, plus one seventy, <laughs> and I, I I did a little sprinkle on Poyes by sub. Plus yeah, I, I was pretty bullish on it. I thought the value was very much there. No, and like even I mean, this, that, let the cow the bag. That bet does not cash, but I don't necessarily regret it because he did threaten a couple subs, and if he was like that was a viable option. Like that, that the, the odds of that happening were not anywhere close to zero. You know. For me, it was like, like the Derek Lewis Curtis Blades KO. It's like that's your only path, and if the value is over three times my money, and it's the only way I can see you winning, but I think you have a chance. I might as well get three three X. And, and I'm not really trying to let myself on the hook off the hook here, but like quite literally, I was at the betting kiosk. I had already made all of my like actual bets I cared about. I had five bucks left in the machine, 
and I was like, I'll throw it on play as myself. Like, that's not trying to let myself off the hook, but like, I literally was just like, oh, I kind of like that value there. Like, rather than throwing together some bullshit <laughs> seven legger or something, I don't know. So, um, so it, I will say we do have to go round by round here because now I'm looking at the judges' scorecards, and Poyace does win at least at one of each round on one's at least one scorecard. Oh, that's crazy! I know. Well, that being said, I have each round close and all caps. Like I thought, this fight was very hard to score, very murky. Super um, murky so, yeah, because we, it was like Ziam trying to navigate the most treacherous waters, so he couldn't get any damage off, and Poyace wasn't doing any damage because his tactic was to just continually threaten the sub. So it made it like this weird grappling match that was also starting with striking and and takedown entries. So I will say, like, if Ziam could have defended takedowns a little better, he wasn't terrible. But I mean, if he could have kept the distance a little better, he or or if he just would have been able to separate all the times he was on top because Poyes was pulling guard sometimes. For sure, man. How'd you score round one? Um. So round one. It's... It was it was really tough. I did go 10-9 Poyes. Um, I have that it's extremely murky and that he did very little damage, but he controlled roughly 4 minutes and 40 seconds of the round. Now, in the 20 seconds he doesn't control, he is getting tagged up. He got up. knocked down. Yeah, he's getting tagged up. So it's like... I had a real I had a real problem scoring it for Poyes, honestly, but I just overarchingly thought like 4 minutes 40 seconds versus 20 seconds, like it's hard to say that you lost that round. But... I mean, no, damage-wise, I, I, I totally understand. No, I mean, I'm with you, honestly. I gave it to Poyes. And because also the knockdown, so Perez Young lands this, and it was a stiff jab, but he lands it like he pretty much countered a Poyes kick. So yeah, Poyes well, was, was like off balance. It wasn't, you could argue it wasn't even truly a knockdown. I don't know if it was scored a knockdown or not. Uh, it was but, not. Uh, it was, uh, oh, wait. So, yeah, it was not. It was not. Yeah, so, so for that reason... It almost comes down to how you see that. If you saw that as a knockdown, you probably gave that round to Zion. But, like, us and the official statisticians saw it more as, like, a slip, off-balance kind of thing, kind of a pushover. Um, and, yeah, Poyas had three takedowns. Um, yeah, not a lot of damage. So, we, we're locked up so far. Um, I'll, I'll lead the dance here in round two. Another super close round. Another hard round to score. I do give two to Zion. I do think he got more damage off. He was defending the subs well. And then really, honestly, it was I was up in the air. How am I going to score this? How am I going to score this? Ziam ends the round on top, landing some decent ground and pound. Bingo. Tilted the scales. Bingo. Tilted literally the scales. literally into the round. Visually better spot. Actually getting a little bit of damage off. And navigated a lot of treachery for most of that round, where it wasn't necessarily like control from Poyes, because Ziam was in the top position, but it was him like... Having to be so careful about everything he did, so I did. Well, yeah, round two when I as a Poyas by sub better round two, I was like, "Is this gonna actually catch?" Like Poyas was threatening. Was, he took the yeah. back at one point. He was he was on the neck. He was throwing up stuff from bottom. I was like, round two. I was like, "Is this actually gonna fucking catch?" It, looked, like, it, it was getting pretty sketchy for uh, anyone on Ziam's side. I will say that for sure. Now, so I have it nineteen nineteen. So do you, which is crazy. Um, one judge agrees with us, actually has the exact same scorecard so far. One judge has Ziam up 20 to 18, totally can see it. Uh, totally and then, can see it. and then one judge has the inverted scorecard of us round one to Ziam, round two to Poyes. I, I can see it. Don't love it, but I can see I it. I can see it. It sucks, but this, this fight's like murky. Yeah. Murky. It really uh, is. Oh um, no, so, for sure. So effectively if Poyes can clearly win round three, he'll win this because two judges have it 1919. Same for Ziam, obviously, but he has one also a 2018. Which I didn't give a fuck about Poyes winning by decision at all. <laughs> so, no, yeah. Specifically by sub. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, round three also super murky because you got Poyes, he gets a takedown, like three minutes of control, very, very little damage. And actually, what I think it comes down to, no sub attempt really in round three. Um, Ziam does get a reversal and once again in this murky 50-50 coin flip round ends the round on top landing shots like decent shots it's so I, was, like, I, I thought the kicks he landed in the start of the round and the way he finished the round was entirely how I scored it for him and I said once again another super close round and honestly that one being a little more snoozy than the others because there weren't the threats of the submissions so yeah I actually liked it for Ziam 
Poyas would have tried to work towards this, some more subs in, in round three, he might have won the fight. And maybe, yeah. But uh, Zion, man, gets the win. Super close, super murky. And because it was so close and so murky, and because I'm really kind of out on Poyas, we talked about it in our text a little bit. These Ryan Hall, Poyas, one dimensional. Whoever the most recent Sean guy Gracie. was that we watched. Yeah, who did I forget? That, that's the guy slipping my name or my. Uh, was it on the Hermanson Pfeiffer card? Uh, see, yeah, I'll get to it. It was. was Hyder, no. Bernie Garcia, no. I mean, honestly, who cares? Because our point is yeah, that so that's out. It is not 1993. It's not 2003. Like, like you being good at jujitsu, honestly, is kind of irrelevant. Ask Joe Selecki. Ask Adolfo Vieira had to, had to seriously alter his style, and you don't see him doing Imanari roles. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's um, a good point. Like, uh, yeah, these players, Ryan Hall. It's actually the guy that was coached by Ryan Hall. I remember the fact that he was coached by Ryan Hall, but I don't remember his name. Um, but, yeah, that style is dead, bro. It's dead. Well, actually, from a betting perspective, I don't think it's dead Oh, Carlos altogether. Vera. Carlos Vera. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, like, I think at the lower end, like on Contender Series or debuts against cans, I think that shit can work then. But any, I'm not even saying top 10. Anybody in, like, the top 30, that shit's not working again. 100%. I agree with you. Like, the age of the specialist being there is done. Now, yeah. I, in relation to our previous main card breakdown, there is a thing about the specialist against other specialists and betting on them to win by the specialty. There is something to that. So well, like, and, and so like see, a Yair I, I Ortega, like real. if you take Yair well, TKO or Ortega sub, both those make the most sense. I, I'll push back as far as this very specific thing we're talking about here, the one-dimensional Ryan Hall guys. Like, almost like what I said about Hadolfo Vieira, like Ortega has made himself not one-dimensional. Now right. he's like yeah, he one-dimension he heavy and wrestle. We he, talked well, about, you said it was the most beautiful for double sure wrestle. you've ever he's seen. Always, he's like, always been able to wrestle, though. But that's what I'm saying. Like, that's not one-dimensional. I agree with you, like, yeah. You, yeah, like, Damian Maya was one-dimensional because he couldn't get the takedowns. Like, if you can get takedowns and you can get subs, that's already two dimensions. Mackenzie Dern, out. Like, ah, just, ah, like, ah. Se- seriously, bro, like, these Imanari rolling, guard-pulling, fucking BJJ players, fucking done, yeah, son. It, it's if you, over. If you refer to yourself it's as a player out of and not a fighter, uh. well, you've already lost. Or you call your jiu-jitsu matches fights, you also lost. <laughs> One hundred percent agree. One hundred percent agree. Let's uh, let's keep it pushing, though. Keep it pushing. Who cares what happens to Ziyam or Poyes? Quite frankly, right? I'm, I mean, am I wrong? I, I hate to be that guy, but it. yeah, honestly, like Poyes, like fully out, and Ziyam, like he's just kind of hanging out. Like, yeah, I mean, for what it's. For what it's worth, I have him sandwiched between Mark Jacasey and Esteban Rebowicz, so which what proves if, our point of who cares. Do you think he's in line to fight like uh, Manuel Torres? If you're trying to stack some wins for Torres and cash some Torres betting slips. They're built then, similarly, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Let's make it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, all, all right. right. Well, well, let's keep it, but we, we got more flyweights up next. Yeah, a lot of flyweights on this card definitely makes sense considering that they're in Mexico City. So uh, now, also that up real quick. What's that? So no fights over the 155 weight class, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah, I brilliant, thought it was brilliant. Brilliant. Because like people talk about like Cain Velasquez in Mexico City as like it's almost like how people talk about like the. Um, the 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 like the ice bowl or like it's like these it's these, these iconic moments like people talk about like Mexico City pain it's almost like a you know what I mean like it's mm-hmm. one of those things that are talked about and, and I think the UFC learned their lesson from there it wasn't necessarily Kane's fault is getting like a man that high, like, that big of a guy at that elevation so the they amount, went the exact opposite yeah the amount of blood you have when you're that big is is obviously a little more and then. More to the point, like the amount of muscle tissue you have, the amount of like sh- blood sugar, blood glu- glucose it demands, 
is way higher, so that means that your blood is going to get depleted way faster when it's already lower oxygen, so it can't travel nutrients as quickly. Like, it just makes sense. Like, big guys shouldn't perform as well at high altitude as smaller guys. It just physically makes sense. I, I thought it was a smart move for them to put all the small guys on here. But, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that briefly. And then, uh, but, yeah, flyweight matchup between Edgar Chires and Daniel Lacerda, plus 370. Um, this was on our parlay as well. And this was a lock because Lacerda, like, I have never been more like this guy <laughs> is the worst can on the roster. You were talking about Sam Hughes, bro. I think Sam Hughes, like, for gender weight class for weight class is, like, multiple times better than Lacerda, bro. I, Lacerda, By the way, I did want to ask man. you, did both the guys officially miss weight or did they, like, agree to fight at 130 or what? what, what the fuck was that? No, this was a fucking chode fest of yeah. Both guys missed weight. It was the fucking can fest. Yeah, was, Shires one thirty one. He literally missed flat weight by six pounds. He was four pounds from bantamweight title weight. Oh, he was a bantamweight. He was a bantamweight that had. A I good wrote test, bantamweight like, as the weight for this because neither guy made flyweight. Well, yeah, that's actually a fair point. And and then you know, um, Daniel Lacerda, Cam McGee, doing himself no favors. Um, also, Shires with the ammo belt on the walkout in fire, Mexico. Pretty fire. good. So pretty dope. Bro, imagine for <laughs> one pound you would have got 30% of Shires' purse, though, if you're Lacerda. One pound. What happens with that? Yeah, does whoever wins get the extra money? Or does no, both it's guys just, 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 you just, like, it's just... You just keep both, both, both fighters miss weight. Like, okay. Like, you both just get your pay now. Like, there's no... Because neither guy's penalized. Like, it's not a penalty. You're both just... You know you, you know, Charez is like, fuck yeah. Bro, whatever. I'm saying, like, was that like a backdoor handshake? Like, he walked up to him and was like, hey, bro, you, how, how over are you? He was like, uh, like, three, four pound. He's like, all right, bro, well, I'm like seven. Like, let's, let's cool this shit. All right. Like, handshake it. He, he walked up with, like, some Sicarios, just like, hey, so we're yeah. not going to make weight. Yeah, so, <laughs> hey, this weight, it's not going to be made uh, by you or me. But... Uh, Really wild. I don't think I've ever seen that. I could be wrong. We've watched a lot of fights. I don't think I've ever seen a fight where it is. When there was the Costa situation where they agreed to it, like, in yeah, the media, beforehand. but, like. I thought it was really weird the UFC think... didn't just, like, call it a catch weight 130. Like, would have made both guys make weight. Weird. Very weird. Um, but, yeah, regardless, I mean, because I have Shires basically as a can himself. I mean, a few notches up. And then, I mean, the fact that Shirez is a minus 485, we got him at minus 500. El Dorado fucked us all night long on value. <laughs> but uh, Shirez shouldn't be minus 500 over anybody. Like, quite literally. I mean, I mean that, that's I've been hammering the Lacerda is the worst can on the roster, like hammering the table, and I think that vindicates me. Yeah, 100%. The dude is not UFC caliber. I mean, what was crazy was that, I mean, Gets taken down, reverses Shires, immediately gets caught in a triangle. It was like watching a, like uh, like uh, an animal get caught in a trap. You know what I mean? When Shires only wins fights by sub, like why are you trying to like wrestle this guy? Was Sarah to just like like F minus like athleticism, F minus IQ? I I, I bro, was to how you feel about Sam Hughes and Jamie Malarkey is how I feel about Daniel was to like or, yeah, dude, I. Yeah, it wasn't even like uh, so much that we were so high on Shires. It was in the ultimate fade of Lacerda. Bro, I, I'm still undefeated on fading like can't hear fighters, which there's another one next week. It might be one of my only like Jamie Pickett fights next week. So you know what's Buckle crazy up. about that? That's like the the, uh, the 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 converse way of finding value is like okay, well, oh yeah, it doesn't even matter. Fading like can't? I don't care if he's I don't care if his opponent's minus five hundred. Like lock it, and if it's a lock. Well, might as well bet it. It's doing something. He's going to lose, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, round one triangle submission for Shires. <laughs> Two minutes, 17 seconds. Don't put a whole lot of stock into this one. But let me ask you this. Power rankings-wise, you have – right next to each other is why I'm asking this question. Shires or Altamirano? Who's, like, higher – Shire slightly. Shire is higher. Slightly, like I think. Uh, Mate- I agree. I agree. Okay, I nice. have him one spot ahead of. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I think Mendonca is just slightly better than either of those guys. 
I actually kind of disagree, but I may have to take that into consideration because Mendoza's at least like young and has like some athleticism and like you know um, I feel you. There's there's kind of there's kind of something on the bone there, something to like. Um, as with Shard, I mean Shardas does have nasty subs. Like we got to remember, like right, like maybe at should have been like, my sub. Yeah, and at like, least he has like a weapon to use. Path the victory, yeah. And he is a dog, yeah, for sure. Lacerda, I'm not over it. Like that, I'm legit convinced that there's like local Reno guys that would beat him at the King of the Cave. Like seriously, <laughs> like the guy. Like, I'm not exaggerating. Like I, mean, I that might be I the went case. to some King of the Cave. And like I saw some guys that could scrap, like like uh, like in, uh, but yeah, let's keep it pushing here. But yeah, I'm just have to dunk on Lacerda one last time. Shiras gets the win, but I'm not high on him either. Ah, uh, yeah, let's keep it pushing to some <laughs> flyweights. So I also think both of these next guys are better than Lacerda. Both of them. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's what I was actually going to say. Is that the winner of this probably should fight Shiras? In all honesty. Yeah, this is kind of like a little flyweight, little Grand Prix. If it you felt will, like here, it. On the, felt on the like it. Yeah, like a bantamweight, so flyweight, he- featherweight Grand Prix. Jesus Aguilar, um, plus one fifteen. We got him at plus one hundred five. We just can't win for losing here, betting in person at the El Dorado. Uh, only five foot four, which is pretty short even for flyweight. M- M- Matash Mendoza, who has taken flights at Bantamweight, so he's kind of a bigger flyweight, only 25 years old. I think he fights out of shoot box. Um, a lot of things on paper that you think you should like about him, then you look at his record and, and you watch him fight, it, is, it just doesn't kind of translate. Uh, it just doesn't translate into Ws. Realistically, this card felt like it was Brazil versus Mexico all night long. I just wanted to point that out. Except for the main event, like Mexico versus America. But... Um... Yeah, this this fight, I do have in my notes that it f- kind of feels like a robbery the way, like, if you watch, like, the winner, I don't want to give it away just yet, but if you watch, like, the winner's reaction afterward, he's, like, walking around like he's in shock and, like, he's like, I don't think I won. I, I'll push back. Here. I scored it for the same, the guy that won. But I'm just saying, it, the, the reaction from both fighters was, like, one guy looked like he acted like he was like, I just got robbed. And the other guy was like, I can't believe I won that. Yeah, but honestly, bro, I, people like to talk about that on Twitter. I mean, it's a decent pod- talking point to bring to this show. I don't put too much stock into that because people, I mean, the commentators say like, oh, I can't judge and commentate at the same time. So how can you judge and fight at the same time? Well, I, it, I don't put I've a ton them, of stock into it. I've heard Felder and those guys talk about like, yeah, certain fights you feel like you win every round and you lose four out of five. And he's like, certain fights you feel like you put on the worst performance and you get a 30-27. He's like, it's hard to know how you're doing in there. Unless some, unless it's obvious. Unless you're um, flatlining, so, yeah. So so here's, here's kind of why I think this gets murky. Because rounds one and two, super close, super close. I gave him to Aguilar, both of them. Round three, not close. Like, Mendoza kind of, like, styled out, like, performed super well in round three. So the only definitive round was for Mendoza. But I think it's very, very, like, reasonable to give Aguilar one and two, which gives him the decision. Now, this is one of the classic example of one championship, probably for Mendoza. On the schoolyard, probably for Mendoza. But scoring 10-9 must, three-round fight, I don't think it's really that big of an issue giving it to Aguilar. I think that's probably very ex- explanatory as to why each guy reacted the way they did. Because I think Aguilar felt like, oh, for the last six minutes of this fight, I just got my ass whooped. And Mendonca was like, for the last six minutes, I was whooping this guy's ass. What do you mean I just lost? So Yeah. Like schoolyard, we all like schoolyard. Mendonca won uh, in the, sh- but that, that's not what this that's is. That's not man. point I, fighting. But, and I argued for Corey Sandhagen to have beaten TJ Dillashaw whenever he lost. So, in this same yeah, case, man. like I gotta say, yeah, J- J- Jose Aguilar, I scored it twenty nine twenty eight for him. Two judges agree. Uh, let's see what round they ended up splitting here. We do have the judges' scorecards available. Um, <clears throat> so they all agree. Round two to Aguilar, round three to Mendoza, they split round one. Well, cause, cause, cause so, in round, so let's talk about round one. We don't think we necessarily got to go round by round, but let's talk about round one a little bit. Round uh, one is the only round so, where I do have really close. Oh, so close, because Mendoza got two takedowns, and he got that late armbar attempt, but Aguilar got more control time, more ground and pound, and ended the round on top. 
So like it's almost like a riddle. Like it's almost you know like like Mendoza was closer to finishing it. Aguilar landed more strikes. Aguilar spent more time on top, and Mendoza got the takedowns. I mean, it, it's very subjective. I scored it for Aguilar, but that was more on like a like a point fighting metrics, right? Like a little more control, a little more damage, but maybe not necessarily threatening more at any point in time. Yeah, no, it was a close round. Both guys did some good work in there. And, and that's why, I mean, you definitely can't call this one a robbery. Uh, Mendoza might disagree, but I thought the right man won. And, I mean, we did better. And this is the only dog of the week that we predicted, so I'll shine my own wheels a little bit. If you this as a straight we'll get into fight. the next fight, and I, and we'll talk about how <laughs> pissed off I am about it. Um, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, we will. I have... mean, our dog picks I mean, were let... looking very good. We, I mean, we can go ahead and keep it pushing because I, I don't really care about. We already talked about what was next for both these guys for the most part, right? The, the only thing I'll say is kind of out of the little Grand Prix, out of all the non-main event flyweights that I watched fight last night, I have Aguilar ranked the highest in my power rankings. You think that's probably accurate? You have to pick one of the three winners moving forward. Of, so, uh, man, I don't know. Out of Dos Santos, include Altamirano if you want. Altamirano, Dos Santos, Chires, and Aguilar. Give me Aguilar. Oh, I thought Rodriguez was going to be on that list. From with Bondar. I'll sure, take, sure. I'll take you going Rodriguez. with him? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, my bad. There, there were so many flyweights. Yeah, yeah. honestly, Shit. that's fair. I don't hate that answer. I don't hate that answer. He I just, just, he I just mean, seemed Aguilar like second then, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just, I, yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, fair, fair, fair. Yeah, no, we can keep it pushing though, because this next fight was a rarity. It was the only time since we've really stepped up our gambling, you know, like our intricacy, not just going with our gut or what. We've really kind of been developing a system here at BK Boys Breakdown for betting UFC fights, and and it's been over fifty percent every week, even this week on a week where we didn't cash any tickets. And the, um, and but, the misses, okay. the misses aren't like a dude getting dog walked across or getting finished in in three minutes, and we're just like sitting there like, what the fuck? It's shit like this. Razor fight. thin, razor thin, razor thin. We were so close to just knocking it out of the park. But um, so we got Christian Quinones, who I gave as a three star lock on the week as a plus one fifty dog, which I've never done that before. I honestly, I like, I had to go back and recheck and like, no, like this is how I'm seeing it, and um. And I don't feel bad about it, man. Quinones, this was like a chill sun in victory. Like, Quinones won. He didn't lose a round. <laughs> Quinones didn't lose a round. <laughs> it's it's wild because I will say that uh, two judges had it 19-19 going into the third and one judge had it 20-18 Quinones. But that does paint the picture that Quinones, two is close. Quinones wins round one. Two is close, but I thought he was winning the fight, like, for sure. And I thought, like, it was a Hail Mary sub attempt that Barcelos even threw up in round three. Yeah, I mean, no, I got to say, bro, I got to say, this is the only thing that didn't drive me nuts, like, that I got to kind of eat as, like, a better that I will adjust for moving forward. Quinones' striking defense is dog shit and his sub defense is dog shit. Like, Quinones is an offensive fighter, not a sound fighter. His his style has holes. Yeah, and I like honestly, finishers, I really put which, a which, lot of stock into Barcelo wearing out at his age in the elevation. But see, I think that held up. That logic held up. Barcelos looked slow. He looked old. Like I, I think that part of our logic held up. Like yeah. Barcelos looked slow and old. Yeah, like he I did, mean, bro. Honestly, too, if you think about it, like. He gets to the to Christian Quinones' neck in a scramble 50-50 position and just dives for it and catches it. Like, it wasn't even, like, the most technical setup or that he got a takedown and worked his way to it. Bro, it was bad submission defense. Yeah, That's quite what I'm literally. Like, like, I know I've been on that all night going back to the Yair fight, but, like... What's up with Mexican fighters and sub defense? Well, I mean, but think about what we said earlier. With the high-level jiu-jitsu guys, it doesn't really work anymore. Why now? Let's finish that statement. Why doesn't it work anymore? Because basically, all professional level MMA fighters have the basic, basic defenses to defend these attacks. But and these subs are working when these basic defenses aren't applied. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. It's just it. And once again, Quinones looked identical to uh, 
Rodriguez in the sense of, like, the dude jumped on his neck, and he wasn't immediately, like, trying to fight the hands or, like, essentially he was way too comfortable being in a very bad mm-hmm. spot. Especially against Barcelos, a veteran, a Brazilian, like, just like you said with Ortega. Like, okay, if this is some slappy on top, maybe you can get away with it, but not against these guys. You got to know who you're fighting. Yeah, what position yeah know you're your in. opponent. Yeah, 100%. Like, you get weeks and weeks and weeks to study. But, yeah, so Barcelos actually catches the kick. There's a treetop takedown, then transitions to the back. Um, but, yeah, get, gets the rear naked choke two minutes and four seconds into a fight that he was losing pretty badly. Like, Quinones was getting touched, but he was way more volume. I mean, he was, you know, he was. He way was, more impact on he, the strikes. Even when he would get taken down, he'd get a reversal or he'd stand up. And when when Barcelos would touch him, Quinones' his chin was holding up. I was oh, worried yeah. he was going to get knocked out because Barcelos was touching the chin, but Quinones' his chin was holding up fine. Uh, which kind of said like Barcelos did kind of look old. Like I think maybe like a younger Barcelos uh, starches him. Yeah, I was going to say as Barcelos kind of slowed down a little bit too. You could see. I thought the start of the third round, I was like, oh, Quinones in a good spot. Barcelos looks a little slow. Yeah, I agree. I was feeling real good. I was getting ready to come out here. Yeah, puff my chest, my chest but, uh, out. Like back-to-back dogs, baby. But I got to say, we gave out a five-legger. The four favorites hit. All right, now, dog. Well, the Rosas pick, right? Was that not on the... That wasn't on our five-legger. No, oh, okay, no, no, good, no. good, 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 good. No, that was on my four-legger with, with Yair, so that wouldn't right. hit anyway. But no. No, our five legger was Naimov, Dos Santos, Shires, Quinones, and Zell Huber. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I'm not mad at that. I'm not apologizing for giving that that five legger. Like, no, we're not. We're it, not like we don't look foolish for that. No, especially not whenever you consider this guy won more of the fight than he lost and just got caught. And it's like that's essentially like losing to a hail mary. I feel like exactly. It was kind of flukish. Um, but yeah, man. So Barcelos gets the win. I gotta say though, like I am down on Quinones. I would have been down on him even if he didn't lose. I'm down on like you. what I saw. The, the holes, striking defense, the, the sub defense. There's too many ways he can yeah. lose. Too many paths to yeah. losing. Especially a bantamweight, bro. Like, right. like bantamweight thing. Like like you want pass to victory, yeah. not pass to losing. Like think about like a Demond Blackshear, who's a back end bantamweight, probably beats Quinones based off what I saw with the submission. Like yeah. I agree. Now, so, and then Barcelos, like, what am I supposed to be high on a 36 year old Barcelos? Like, 37. No. 37, yeah. So, it's this fight was kind of a, I, this fight didn't make sense to me to have as the future prelim, honestly. Like, I guess they were trying to build Quinones and we were high on Quinones, but I would have rather seen, I would have rather seen uh, Nymov, but I'm also kind of a Nymov ball washer, so whatever. I agree with you now. Quick, you want to do a quick little look ahead to this uh, this dog water at UFC Fight Night? I, I do. Let's let's do it like a separate video. I like that. It brought oh, me yeah. to the channel. It worked, um, I, and I got a piss. So, Sweet. but yeah, man. So, not the best ending, but like and subscribe and fucking um, and yeah. That, thanks for watching the prelim segment. Let me know if you want any money. I said four out of five on a five leg. And the only one that misses is the dog, and it almost hits. I ain't even mad at it. Like, yeah. And if you faded the one, if you faded our one dog pick and just took the faves, we gave you at least four favorites that were locked in. Yep, for sure, bro. Like, subscribe, follow the picks, the bets. We'll be back with a little, little quick little breakdown of a uh, dog water fight night.